Well, good morning. Everybody enjoying this weather? Yeah, I don't mind this at all. It was 36 this morning at the house, and that was all right because I was in the house. (laughs) It doesn't take long for it to warm back up, though. We're in Luke chapter 2, and I think we're about midway through the chapter. Before we get started this morning, uh, Matt, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this time thankful for the opportunity to open your word and study from you this morning. We pray that you would guide us in our efforts to learn more about uh, your word, you, those things that you would have us to do as we serve you, Lord. Thank you for the many blessings of life that you provide for us for this first day of the week and what it means to us as Christians to be able to assemble together today to worship you, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, there are many that are unable to be here with us due to illness. We pray your blessings upon them, that it would be your will, Lord, that they might be able to regain their health and strength and once again come back and, and worship with us. Guide us as we enter into this hour. For this we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, so if you're confused because the lesson sheet says... Chapter 3, that's because we're not there yet. But we're going to get there. That's what we're going to get into. But we need to finish up chapter 2. And I believe we're in verse 25. Is that those who... Okay, all right. Okay. And I, I had some extra copies of last week's lesson, but we had a funeral, so they're gone. I don't know where they went to. But uh, Does anybody want one? We can probably print a copy or something. Last week's. Okay, all right, well, we'll not worry about it. Beginning there in verse 25, he says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought him, in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things, those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. All right, what was Simeon waiting for? All right, look at what it says. Yes, it's a Christ, but what what does it say? All right, the Lord's Messiah. Y'all are hitting all around it. There you go, the consolation of Israel. What does that mean? What does consolation mean? Okay, encouragement is another word for it. Comfort. Comfort. So it, it is that word that, that uh, you know, we've st- over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it talks about the comfort that is, you know, how all comfort is from God. Well, that word comfort is what's talked about here. That's the same Greek word. And so the consolation, the comfort of Israel, that's what he's waiting for. And it's interesting that he puts it that way. If you go over to Isaiah chapter 40, uh, what we see there is, is it's spoken of as the comfort uh, as would come from God. He says, beginning in verse 1, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double all her sins, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and so forth and so on. 
All right, and so what we see is the comfort of Israel is, is, is in those prophecies. You know, this is what they were waiting for. And so Simeon is waiting for the comfort of Israel. And yes, it's the Christ. It is the, the, uh, the Son of God who he is waiting for. Consolation, that's a good point. Consolation is capitalized, but now in the Greek we didn't have any capitalization. So that's an English translation thing, and they often do that when it is talking about Jesus. Yeah, but there again, that's a, that's a translation thing, and so it's not always, you know, you can't bank on that being capitalized as that's being the Son of God. Of course, we know it is. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's a good point. All right, uh, how did he know he would see Christ? Holy Spirit told him. Told, what, what did the Holy Spirit tell him? He wouldn't see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. So here's a good question for you. How old was Simeon? Don't know. We don't know how old he was. We don't know if, uh, you know, if he is reaching the end of his years. We don't know, you know, when he died beyond this. Uh, it, nothing really tells us. But we do know that uh, it was promised to him that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. Now, that may indicate to us that maybe he was up in years, you know, and, and maybe that was the Holy Spirit telling him, look, you're, you know, I know you're old, but, you know, you're going you're gonna to hang on until you see Christ. Uh, but we don't know that for sure. We don't know that for sure. How did he know to go to the temple that day? Holy Spirit. When we see there in verse 27, it says he came by the Spirit or in the Spirit into the temple. And so the, the Holy Spirit is leading him to the temple that day why would it be important that the Holy Spirit lead him there that day? Right, that's, so that's whenever uh, Mary and Joseph are bringing Christ to the temple, but why couldn't it be another day? Right, the, the dedication of the child, they're fulfilling all of that law. Why was it important that the Holy Spirit lead him there that day? What? They're naming Jesus. They're doing all those things for Jesus that day. I, I realize that I'm making you think, okay, what are you wanting, Roger? All right? But, but this is a valid point that we need to think about. There were very few times that Jesus actually went to the temple. When you look through the, the gospel accounts, he was not in the temple every day. A lot of his uh, ministry was done in Galilee and, and then on his way to Jerusalem. When he came to Jerusalem, you know, during his ministry, yes, he was, he was in the temple regularly. But, I mean, here we're talking about as a child. Now, later on we read, you know, 12-year-old, he's, he's at the temple. But, but they're sparse occasions because he doesn't live in Jerusalem. He lives in Nazareth. And so it would have been important then if the Holy Spirit is going to promise him, look, you're going to see the Christ before you die, it would have been important for the Spirit to guide him there that day to make sure that that happens. I, I just bring that out because we want, we want to see the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, in all of these events and how all of these things are laid out. Now, I didn't have any questions on this, but you'll notice what, uh, what um, Simeon is saying here in verses 29 through 32. But notice what he says in verse 32, a light to bring revelation to who? To the Gentiles, all right? And so there again, Luke is bringing out the idea that the Christ is not just for the Jews. 
He is for all people. And, you know, the other accounts didn't necessarily pull that out as much, but Luke is really trying to make sure that that is understood. Any other thoughts or comments before we continue? I know we skipped some of that, so if you want, if you got a question about it. All right, let's go on to verse 36. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. What do we know about Anna's age? She was old, all right? She was old. <laughs> she was on up in years. Uh, the, the language there is difficult uh, as far as that 84 years is concerned. All right, was she a, a widow for 84 years or was she a widow that was 84 years old? You know, and it, it really could go either way as far as the language is concerned. If she was a widow for 84 years, that would probably put her in the hundreds, uh, you know, depending on how you, you look at when marriage would have taken place and all those things. But, uh, but it's possible. It's possible. But probably she was 84 years old. All right, what did she do on that day? Gave thanks. And then what did she do? She talked about it. She told everybody. And so, it, you know, this is not, again, this is not something that is done in a corner. And Luke is pointing that out. He's showing, look, this news has been spread. You know, they've been talking about this all this time. It's not something that, you know, that was a secret thing done. All right, any other questions on that? I'm, we're moving along. Verse 39, beginning. So, when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the, the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to be uh, in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. All right, what is said about Jesus' early life? Before he was 12. All right, grew, became strong in spirit, and was filled with wisdom. Uh, looking at the, the textual variants and, and things like this, probably in the spirit is not in there, was, was probably not in the original. Uh, and that, that literally would read, he was growing and becoming strong while being filled with wisdom. Okay? And so, which is what you would hope for a child growing up. You know, that, that they would grow and they would be able to understand things and do things, that sort of thing. Where was Jesus found whenever uh, they went back to Jerusalem? 
in the temple, in the courts, listening to the teachers. All right, and that's what I'm trying to get to. He was found among the teachers. He was found among those who were, were talking about the Word of God and teaching people about the Word of God. At the early age of 12, he showed his interest in doing the will of the Father. Now, why 12 years old? Anybody know? Think about Jewish customs. Coming of age, but not hardly there yet. All right? The age of 13 to, in, in Jewish culture was the age when one became amenable to the law of Moses. All right? That's, that's how they viewed the age of 13. And so the age of 12 would have been an age where they're really focusing on teaching and trying to help them come to that point. All right? And so Jesus being among the teachers, that, that is not far-fetched. Okay, that's not something that would, that would be out of the ordinary. What is out of the ordinary is his understanding, their astonishment at his understanding in all of these things. And so definitely there is something different with Jesus at this point, but the idea of him being among the teachers, now, you know, him being left among the teachers, that's odd. <laughs> but yes, he would have spent time uh, there, and probably many of the, of the 12 year olds of that time would have been in the same place. But, you know, whenever it came time to go home, they're, they're going to go home. Jesus didn't go home. He stayed there because that is where his interest lied. So Jesus' response wasn't totally out of line there. All right, what is said about Jesus after this event? Looking there in verse 52. He increased in... Favor with God, but wisdom and stature. Okay, all right, so we, what we've got there is we've got three different things that he increased in. He increased in wisdom. That's talking about knowledge of the, the law of God, things like that. He increased in stature. What is that? Yeah, he grew up. He, you know, physically, he, he got bigger. And then he grew in favor with God and men. What's that talking about? What's that? All right. Grew as a Christian, as a child of God. All right. Uh, is that what that means? Grew in favor with God and men. All right. It sounds like God was pleased with him. So, yes, we have that. He's growing in favor with God learning, you know, the law of God and, and learning to live uh, accordingly. But then we have the other side of that, growing, growing in favor with men. What is that talking about? Okay, it's possible that they are starting to talk about him. As I said before, you know, Luke's pointing out these things are not done in a corner. And so that's a possibility. Here this same Jesus that was born 12 years ago and, and all this, you know, talk was said about him. Here he is in the temple. I tend to lean to not that being the case. But absolutely that's a possibility. He grew with the believers, okay, possibly. All right, so the ones that he's talking to is, is the ones that, he's, he, that killed him, you know, the teachers, those so forth. Um, yes, I mean, yes, he, he grew in favor with believers, but that's going to come later. He's 12 years old, okay? We're talking about still a child, 
who is still, yes, he was among the teachers, and yes, his understanding was astonishing, yet he was still there as a pupil. So when we're talking about him growing in favor with God and men, he's growing in favor with God because he continues to increase in this wisdom, you know, the law of God and doing those things, but he grows in favor with men because he's sociable. He is not a child that is hid away somewhere and not among the people. He is a sociable person. And I think this still, again, ties into with what Luke's talking about. This was not done in a corner. He grew in favor. I think there's an important lesson there in that, that we as Christians need to learn to be sociable. If we're going to spread the gospel, if we're going to show the world what Christ is and who Christ is, we've got to learn to be sociable. Now, is that what he's talking about? I don't know. I don't know. But that's what I see whenever I I read some of those things. Being obedient, absolutely. There in uh, in verse 51, you know, he he was subject to them. He He made himself submit to the authority of his parents. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, and, and oftentimes we see this. So what she's talking about is this idea of growing in favor with God and men. If, if you grow closer to God and be more godlike in your life, we're actually going to talk about that in the worship hour this morning. But when you actually learn to live that way, the world sees you as favorable. I mean, the world likes honest people, do they not? I mean, the world likes kindly people, people who are, you know, who are nice to you and and loving, and the world likes that. You know, a lot of times we we talk about how the world will persecute, you know, and things like that, persecute Christians, but the general walk of a Christian, of a Christ-like life, the world enjoys that, and it is favorable to men. So, yeah, I think there's a whole lot to that. Okay. We ready to go to chapter 3? All right. I'm going to try and get through it this morning. I know that sounds weird. Let me explain it to you like this. I studied chapter 3 for three days. And whenever I got through studying, I realized we just need to get through it. (laughs) There are so many rabbit trails that we could go down in chapter 3, and and I'll point out a few things as we go through this. And we may not get through it, and that's fine too. All right, so let's begin chapter 3, verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ateria and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All right, so first of all, what was John preaching? Baptism of what? Repentance. Baptism of repentance. For what? For remission of sins. We've got to get all that in there. So it's a baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Now, whenever John baptized people, were their sins removed? 
Oh, that's a deep cut. Never mind. That's, that's one of those rabbit trails. <laughs> I'm going to tell you they weren't, but they were anticipated to be taken away. Does that make sense? When were their sins taken away? When Jesus shed his blood on the cross. That's when those sins were taken away. And so we need to understand that. That was the point at which sins were taken away. Uh, but yes, they're, they're doing this in response to the will of God in order to receive remission of sins. Notice that Luke gives the, the reader another time stamp here. All right? Talks about the Caesar who is in power. Talks about Herod who's in control of the region. And was talking about, uh, you know, Philip and, and Lysanias. There's actually not a whole lot uh, in, in extra biblical texts about Lysanias. There are hints. But uh, we don't know a lot about him. But the others are well documented. And so you can go back and you can see when these events actually occurred. Uh, the date that, that most put on it is 28 or 29 A.D. Okay, and so if you wanted to write that down in your Bibles or something. Annas had been high priest. However, he had been deposed by Valerius Gratus in A.D. 15. But he is still alive. And his sons were then put, uh, as, put up as high priest. Eleazar would have been put up as high priest uh, there in 15 A.D., and he served to about 17 A.D., uh, and then he was deposed, and then Caiaphas was put in at, at high priest at that point. But at this point that he's talking about, Caiaphas is the high priest that the Roman government had put into place. All right? And so whenever it says Annas and Caiaphas, the reason it says that is because the Jews still would view Annas as the high priest. He is the, the rightful high priest. But the Romans come in and they mess with that. And so because of that, Annas pulls a whole lot of weight. All right, But Caiaphas is the acting high priest at that time. And notice that it says the word of God came to John in the wilderness. And so, and that is the reason why uh, he is preaching this repentance uh, for the remission of sins. Or baptism for the remission of sins. Okay. What, um, what was the purpose of his preaching? To prepare the way of the Lord. To prepare, and we saw this in the other two accounts. Uh, mentioning that John the Baptist was to prepare, you know, he is the Elijah to come. Uh, he is the one that's going to prepare the way of the Lord. We read some of this text over in Isaiah 40 earlier. But what I want you to notice that Luke points out in verse 6. He says, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, there again, he's pointing to the fact this gospel is for everybody. It is not just for the Jews. All right. Any thoughts, comments before we continue? Yes. Y yes, I'm sorry, you're right. You're absolutely right. Caiaphas was actually Annas' son-in-law. That is correct. I had a chart I was going to put up on, on the thing, and I actually put it in the PowerPoint, and it was ready to go, and then I remembered that I didn't remember where I got it from. And I didn't want to do that and not give credit where credit is due. Uh, but in my studies, as I was looking through it this week, I came across that chart and I just quickly clipped it, you know, so I could put it into PowerPoint, and then I couldn't find it. I, I looked yesterday evening and I just couldn't find where it was, so I just didn't put it there. But what it was is it showed the kind of the family tree of Annas and then all of his sons uh, and, and Caiaphas, his son-in-law, and when they served as high priests. Uh, and it kind of gave the, the year ranges and all that. It was, it was interesting, but I just took it out because I didn't know where I got it from. So, All right. Continuing on, verse 7 through 14 says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, What shall we do? And so he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. All right, whom is Luke addressing? Who's he talking to? All right, so we've got the people. We see that there in verse, uh, um, verse 10. So the people asked him, what? Okay, Jews, because it says, you know, you don't say to yourselves, Abraham is your father. What does it say there at the beginning of verse 7? All right, the multitudes that came out to be baptized, okay? When you go look at the other accounts it points out that these that he is specifically talking to in verses 7 through 9 are the Pharisees and scribes. They came out to him and was, you know, and, and he was saying, you brood of vipers. Luke doesn't point that out. Luke lumps all the people together. And he says this brood of vipers. I mean, that's pretty harsh language, is it not? Now, we know from the other accounts that he's addressing the Pharisees. He's re re addressing those that are hypocritical about all these things. But Luke doesn't, he doesn't play it that way. You know, he, he just says, look, these are things that were said, and this is how it came out. And I just find it interesting how he, uh, he includes all those people in there. What does he tell them to do? Right, produce fruits worthy of repentance. Fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, what is repentance? I've told you this many times. Change of what? Change of heart, heart and mind, okay? That's what repentance is. It is a change of heart and mind. That, in the strictest terms, that's what repentance is. The works that you change as a result of that are actually a separate thing. But I love the way Luke points this out and shows us, look, those, those, change, those actual changes that you make, those are the fruits that are worthy of that repentance. They are worthy of that change of mind that you have. And so when we think about repentance that way, it, it helps us in, in a lot of areas to understand some things. For example... In Acts chapter 2, how many people were baptized? 3,000. How many of them repented? 3,000. I mean, yeah, as far as we know, I mean, you know, that's, a, that's on them whether they actually did or not. But that's what Peter told them to do. You need to repent and be baptized. Okay? Now, here's my question. Do you think maybe there was any of those 3,000 people who had problems with sinful situations in their lives that maybe didn't get taken care of that day? We need to understand that repentance and the actions based upon that repentance sometimes are different things. We need to understand that it is that change of heart and change of mind. It is the belief. It is the confession. It is all those things that must be involved with our salvation. But actually fixing the problems, that comes as a result of all of that. And we have to work at that sometimes. And so here he gives some practical application, and we're going to talk about this in our, in our worship hour, so I'm not going to read through all that again. But he gives them practical things that you can do based upon that repentance. You need to change. 
You need to change. And so here's some of the things that you can do to show that you have actually repented. Any questions? Thoughts? Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and that's a good point. That's what repentance is. When we say change of mind, it, it, we do need to be more specific. It's a change of mind going toward God rather than toward the world. You know, we can, we can change our mind all day long, flip-flop back and forth, all right? But we're changing our mind to, to, to be in line with God's will. And, and that's what John is pointing out to them. These are things they should have been doing all along. You know, but now he's saying, look, you need to get back in line with God. Tim, do you have That's going to be a deeper discussion. Because <laughs> I've, I've been doing a lot of thinking on this lately. All right, but let me, let, me, let me get what he's talking about. All right, so John, where is he when he does all this? He's in the wilderness. The people are coming out to him. When we see Jesus doing his ministry, it is not the same as John. But you do often find people coming to him, all right? Here, here's what we need to think about as far as the differences in the ministry, I think. John the Baptist was vocal. He was putting it out there, and he was letting everybody know this is what's happening, and y'all need to get on board. And he is spreading that news. When Jesus begins his ministry, it is not that way. Jesus is quiet in the way he does his ministry. He is sitting in groups and teaching groups of people. As, as his popularity spreads because of the miracles he does, then people begin coming to him. But it is not the same type of ministry. And so whenever we look at John, we see how this how he is pre, he is preparing that way you see he's he is spreading the news that the kingdom is at hand he is letting the people know look it's coming you need to be getting ready for this and because of the way he did his ministry it made it easier for Jesus to do his ministry when you look back at verse, uh, verses 4 and 5 where it talks about prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. That language is used uh, not necessarily in Scripture but in other places referring to how the armies would go before royalty to prepare the way so that whenever royalty came through, they didn't have any problem getting there, all right? And so they would have understood that. They would have recognized and picked up on that language. That's what John's doing. He is preparing the way for royalty. Well, oftentimes, whenever they would do that, we're talking about trumpets shouting and a lot of commotion and, and everything. You know, whenever the, the armies came through and made ready for it, people knew something was coming. They knew something was coming, and that's what we see in John. He made it so that they knew something was coming. Gary. Yes. 
Yes, that's a good point. I didn't, I didn't uh, point that out, but yes. So in verse 2, he's talking about how he received the word in the wilderness, but then he went to the regions around Jordan. He's preaching the baptism of repentance, and then he's back in the wilderness when the people come to him. And so, yes, he's out proclaiming this, getting people's attention, and then they're coming out to him. Uh, and and we, it's just different with Jesus. It's just different whenever we see his ministry and we get into that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I, all through Scripture, what he's talking about, it, we're still talking about the difference in the ministries, but all through Scripture we find God pleading with people to change. Not forcing people to change. Not shoving it down people's throats. But he sends word through his prophets. He sends word through those who are inspired to plead for the people to come. And whenever Jesus was doing his ministry, he didn't force it on people. You know, he just put it out there like it is. And if they accepted it, they accepted it. If they didn't, they didn't. And it was, I mean, that's what God wants. If you want to believe in him, he is more than willing to accept you. And, you know, if, if you do his will, all these things like that. But if you're going to reject him, then he is more willing to let you reject him. It is, it's belief. That's, that's what it all has to do with. And, and oftentimes, I, we talk about old-time preachers, you know, how they, they used to really get on it, you know, and step on toes and hearts and emotions and all those things. That's not the way Jesus preached. That is not the way he preached. He just spoke the word of God, and if they believed it, they believed it. If they didn't, they didn't. And I think sometimes we need to think about that. All right, I want to get through this next section. Verses 15 through 20. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the weed into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added to this, above all, that he shut John up in prison. All right, what does Luke say about the people at this time? Here in verse 15. All right, they're expecting the Messiah to come. Uh, he doesn't say that, though. He just says they were in expectation. Yes, we're making that assumption based upon the rest of the verse, that that's what they're waiting for. Uh, but yes, they are in expectation, or they are waiting for something. All right? They're waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Why are they in expectation? See, that's one of them rabbit holes. <laughs> one of them trails that you can go down and you can spend a lot of time on. What came to my mind, and I'll just I'll, I'll talk about this and then we'll close. There, there was, it, it just popped in my mind. Well, let me tell you another possibility first. There, first, John had been preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we need to understand that. 
So he is spreading this news that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so whenever they hear kingdom of heaven, your Messiah goes right along. We've got to have the king that goes along with that. And so that's part of the reason why they would be in expectation. The expectation seems to be, though, that, that they were in expectation before John began to preach. Because it, it looks to me as though, and it, and it may very well not be, but it looks to me as though they were in expectation whenever John began preaching the way he did, they turned and said, hey, is this, is this the one we're expecting? All right? So that being case, when we think about why they might already be in expectation, they didn't know when the Messiah was going to come. However... In the prophecies, there were certain things that pointed to a time frame. Most of the Jews missed it. All right? And I had heard this years ago, and this is one of those things that I spent a lot of time studying about. I found a lot of articles talking about this, but in the articles, I could not get the link to the actual material to make sure that that was actually true, what I was reading about. All right? And it has to do with the scepter leaving Judah. Uh, And for some reason, I didn't write that reference down, but I think it's in Genesis 49. If you'll look over there with me. Genesis 49. Jacob is, is, uh, you know, doing the blessings on his children. Verse 9 says, Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, uh, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall arouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. All right? Shiloh was understood by the Jews here to refer to the coming Messiah. And so what he's saying here is that the the scepter will not depart from Judah until the Messiah comes. Now, was there a king on the throne in Judah whenever Jesus came? As far as the lineage, the correct lineage is concerned. The answer is no, there was not. But the scepter does not necessarily refer to the reigning king. It refers to power. That's what the scepter is is a reference to. And what we find is, and and I had heard this years ago, and so I started digging to see if I could find it, and I came across an article from La Vista Church of Christ uh, that was talking about this. And he listed references from Josephus talking about at around 30 A.D. is when they lost, the Jews lost the right to put someone to death. Capital punishment. That was taken away from them at that time. And uh, I finally found it. It was not in antiquities. It was in the War of the Jews. Uh, where he talks about it. And so there's a, there's a quote in the War of the Jews, and I forget who it was who was in, in power at the time, the Roman who took that power away. His name started with a C. He was not a governor or, you know, or anything like that. He was just like an administrator type person. But he took that power away from them in 30 A.D. There was also a reference to a Rabbi Bachman in that article, Uh, In the Jewish Talmud, I was not able to find that reference. But the quote that he had in there talked about, woe woe is Israel because basically, and I don't remember the exact quote, but but the scepter had departed and in their eyes the Messiah had not come. Okay, so they understood the act of the scepter departing as that act that they, they, basically they were, their power to rule was taken away at that point, and it was given to the Romans. And so what we have there is the the scepter did pass away 
during that time. And the majority of the rules didn't pick up on it, but there very well may have been others who picked up on that because they went into mourning and all kinds of things whenever they lost that power. The Jews were in, a, in an uproar uh, over all of that. And so it was not something that would have been quietly done. They would have all known about it. And a lot of times it is the way with people. The ones who are in power don't actually see what's going on. The ones who are not in power, the common people, they're the ones that actually see what's happening. And so it could very well be, and I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if this is, this is what it's referring to, but they were in expectation of this time. And, and we see the other references in the New Testament that talk about how it, it leans toward the idea they were expecting the Messiah any time. Yeah, so there, there were markers that pointed to this time frame. And I wanted to share that with you. I just really thought that that was interesting, uh, some of those things that I could come across. Second part of verse th- uh, number three, how does John respond to their thoughts of him being Christ? Simply, it isn't me. It isn't me. But he, but he made sure that it was understood. And he gave a description of who that, would, that one would be. What marks the end of John's ministry? Going to, yeah, him being put in prison. So that marks the end of his ministry. And then as we get into the next few verses, he's actually going to do a backtrack and talk about, you know, the baptism of Jesus that actually happened before he was put in prison. I know we went long this morning and we still didn't even get done, but that's okay. That was interesting. I think it's interesting. Do y'all like interesting things? I like interesting things. So there you go. Appreciate your attention this morning. I didn't click my button once, did I? I don't have my button. No, there it is. Yeah, fine. Maybe. There it goes. There it goes. So, yeah, we're, we're in this last portion now, the ministry of John. All right? And then we'll, uh, we'll get into the baptism of Jesus next week.